if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. I hear some people starting cars out there. It's getting a little bit cold for some of you to have the windows open. Just don't drive away. Um, Acts chapter 12, and I, I put my notes in, a, in a, a literal notebook this time because last time when, it, it, uh, when the wind came up a little bit, it wanted to blow my notes away, and so, uh, so I'm trying to fight against that a bit today. But Acts chapter 12, let me get there as well. We walked through part one of this message last week, and uh, if you weren't here, I'll just uh, state the title of it. This, the, the title is Faith, Freedom, and Staying the Course, and as I said, this is part two. Um, this message then is a, is a bigger part, it's kind of the conclusion of what happened last week. But it's also part of a, of a bigger story that goes all the way back, and I'm not going to spend time there today, but all the way back to Acts chapter 2, which is the start of the church. And who is the church? The church is me. The church is you. And so when we say the beginning of the church or the, the foundation building of the church, we are here today, as we are here today, um, as representation of of what took place all the way back there in Acts chapter 2. And so what we're reading about when we read through e even today's scripture, Acts chapter 12, is our story. It's how we got here to where we are today in part. And, and so I, I want to challenge you um, just to think of it in those terms. Um, we are here today in drive-in church because there were people in Acts chapter 2 who responded in the fashion that they responded in the city of Jerusalem 2,000-ish years ago. Otherwise, we are not here. Um, I know some of you are going, I would rather be inside than right here. Um, and I agree with you. And I want to kind of put a, put a statement out here in the form of an asterisk. I, I sent out information to our church board and our staff. We're chewing on some stuff as it relates to uh, the feedback that we've received from an abundance of sources on how we should handle things moving forward as a church. And I, I want to say that somehow, in some context, maybe within a month from today or lesser, um, we should be able to meet in some fashion in there, okay? Does that sound all right for some of <laughs> you? It will not be as it was um, before we moved out, but we're working on that, and it's going to have, uh, I'll, I'll tell you one of the things we're considering, in some regard, um, in order for you to get inside, you're going to have to make reservations, probably, <laughs> so that we can book you into seating arrangements and things like that, which um, uh, will be different, but it's still going to be good, amen? Amen? Anybody? All right. So pray with us about all that. It's coming. So here's the deal. Like I said, we walked through part one of this last this message last week, and it was broken into these kind of sections, if you remember. If you don't, I'm going to go through them very quickly. Last week's message was broken into this uh, these components. There was what Herod did. And some of you might remember what Herod had done to kind of get us to where we are today is he had executed James, the brother of John, and then he had arrested and imprisoned Peter. And then the second uh, component last week was what the church did. And in essence, if you go back to that portion of Scripture, the first 10 verses here uh, in Acts chapter 12, the church prayed. They immediately decided, one of us is in prison, we need to pray for him. And it wasn't just one of us, it was, it was the main leader for the brand new church. Um, Paul was coming into the picture, but just recently. And so the, the strongest voice, the one that goes all the way back to Acts chapter 2, who shares that message, the strongest voice 
of the new group of followers of the way, followers of the Christ, is Peter, the Apostle Peter. And so he's been imprisoned. The church prays. And then we get to uh, what the Lord did. The Lord sent an angel of freedom. How many need an angel of freedom in your life uh, today? Anybody at all? Okay. So the Lord sent an angel of freedom to Peter, who released him um, from a literal imprisonment. And what Peter did, so we had what Herod did, what the church did, what the Lord did, what Peter did, he simply obeyed what the angel told him to do, which is always a good practice, people of God, to obey. If God tells you something through an angel or through his spirit, it's a good plan to obey. And then the last point from last week was what it meant. And I ended up with uh, the idea of staying the course. And, and the reason I came to that point and have that as kind of the, the point in some regard today, too, is that... We are often challenged to stay the course. Sometimes it's just distraction. I, I, I don't want to ask for raised hands and you don't have to honk your horn, but I, I've been a pastor for 35 years. And if there's one thing the church struggles with, it's distraction. I mean, we absolutely are distracted from what God wants to do in us and through us at different times for a variety of reasons. Another thing that the enemy does to mess us up is distortion. He, he gives us enough of the truth or gives the church enough of the truth from a voice that it kind of sounds like a good thing, but it's a distortion of the whole truth of God. And so we're compromised sometimes in our obedience and we struggle with staying the course because of distraction or distortions that are, that are abundant and around us. But I want to say to you again, stay the course. I, I'm reminded of, uh, of the story of Winston Churchill who was asked to come and deliver a message uh, to, uh, uh, to a group that was gathered at, Her I think it was Herod's Men's Academy. There was a whole... They were soldiers, and, and it was at the height of World War II, and, and uh, the people that he was leading were a bit panicked and, and distracted and anxious. And so they asked for Winston Churchill to come and give this message uh, to those people, and he walked up to the microphone, he, and he said, this, he said this to him. He said, never give up. Never, never, never Never give up. And then he dropped the mic and went away. Well, he didn't literally drop it. That's what we do today. But he put the mic back and walked away. A pretty concise and simple message. We cannot give up on what God has asked us to do. No matter what it is, we've got to stay the course. So that's where we pick up. Now, we've mostly looked at this portion of Scripture from Peter's perspective. Um, in some ways, this is kind of his story. The writer is sharing us very specifically. Hang on a second. I got to consolidate a few things here on the uh, on my stand. But we've looked at this mostly from Peter's perspective. And like I said, in some ways, this is his story. But I, I want you to notice today how it moves from being a story about what God does in Peter's life to just in general, the story of God and what God does. And I want to say this to you too while I'm saying this, that's where it always needs to go. When God does something in any one of our lives, it's great and it's exciting that he has done that in our life, but it needs to come under the heading of what God's story is and what he's doing. If we lay claim to it, if we hang on to it all the time, it doesn't achieve the purposes he had for it. Now, I'll explain that a little bit further as we go. I want to finish, uh, want to finish um, kind of moving into today's message by giving us just a little bit of, of backstory here, the specifics, in case you weren't uh, available last week. At the tail end, well, actually, in the first 10 verses uh, of, the, of chapter 12, we read that, uh, as I said, the angel of the Lord comes and intervenes on Peter's behalf. And here's where it kind of wraps up. It says, um, it says the angel of the Lord kind of nudges Peter awake. And then he, the angel of the Lord walks Peter right out of the prison. Past how many guards, if any of you remember? Four times, four sets of guards. So right past 16 guards. 
And, and that ends then last week on verse 10. It says they passed the first and second guards. That should be like groups of guards. And they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Now I'm going to skip to the very end of the portion of scripture that we're at today, verses 18 and 19, because I want you to hear how Herod responds, and then we're going to get back to what the church does or how it responds. But we remember that Herod had locked up Peter. That was his intent, but obviously in verse 10, he's, uh, he's led to freedom by this angel. Verses 18 and 19... Find that in your scripture. i got to turn the page here for me really quick. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. And after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here uh, because the meat of the... Uh, of what I wanted to focus on is, is before these verses. But I just wanted to say this. The response of leadership by someone who uses fear and intimidation to hold their position is to do exactly what happened here. Now, that is not a political statement today. That's just the reality. And that was what was taking place at that moment in time. It's also a reminder to us when we read through these verses that the people of faith in the New Testament church were in battle with real consequence. These were real people. Peter was a real person. Herod was a real person. Those 16 guards who lost their lives were real people. If we read the New Testament, if we read any of God's word and we kind of go, that's a neat fairy tale, that is not fairy tale. That is real life with real consequences. The story of faith has real and difficult consequences that are always connected to it. If we think that we're going to live through this life and just kind of skate through and never, uh, never deal with some difficult, frustrating, heart-rending situations, I need to sit down with you because this past week included all that stuff. I talked to people, well, I'm not even going to go into the details. Last night, just praying for people who are struggling with real issues. But the good thing is that God's word not only deals with people who have real issues, real pain, real suffering, it has answers for people like you and me who have real pain and real suffering. Aren't you glad to hear that today? It, it doesn't skip through. It's more real than we want to believe at times. So the question is this, though, as we work through that, what do we do when those really difficult things happen? As we've already mentioned, we pray, we look for ways to act, and then we wrestle. Now, I'm not talking about <laughs> some of the things that come to mind, um, uh, WWF. I'm not talking in terms of that. The scripture uses that term, Ephesians 6, 12. It reminds us of who and what we're wrestling uh, who we're wrestling with and what we're wrestling about. Ephesians 6:12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I, I want you to repeat that with me in, in your cars or at home. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The truth is is that that's what gets the media's attention. Flesh and blood always gets the media's attention. But here's what we need to grab a hold of today. Ephesians 6.12, again, the, after those verses, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have to remember this. As real as the enemy is, or as real as the Lord is, let's, let's start there, and everything that he did for Peter here, the enemy is every bit as real. And he is doing things all the time, and, and I've already talked to that about that, so I won't stay there. So we, we left Peter last week kind of in a bit of a daze. He, he comes to the end of that street, led by the angel. He's got freedom from prison. He's walked right past the guards. He's escaped everything that Herod intended. And that's where we pick up this week in verse 11. Verse 11 reads this way. Let me get back there. It says, Then 
Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So in your outline, it goes like this. The first point or point B here, I should say, is this is what happen when, happens when God steps in. When God steps in. And we, when God steps in, we realize a few things. When God steps in, things are different than they used to be. Uh, Zechariah 4.6 says this. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my, say it as loud as you can, not by, <laughs> but by my, Denise, spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And Peter's words here are so great because they acknowledge that. They show this God awareness that he has of what has just happened. Uh, it reminds us of a couple things in, in the way that he expresses it. I'll, I'll read that one more time. It says, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. <laughs> wow, I, that's such a huge, that's a huge phrase. And rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Peter's words reveal this, a couple things. It's, it, it lines up with the uh, with other speakers that we have, particularly in the Old Testament, who said things like, who am I that God is mindful of me? That he remembers me at a time like this. And so what you see in Peter's words here, he's humbled and he's thankful. Right off the bat, he sees that God has come on his behalf. So when, when, when God steps in, we realize that it's all about him, the one who rescued me. I'm, I'm going to say something here. It's a rather long phrase, and you probably won't have time to write it down for those who are writing stuff down, but I'll say it twice, and I want to say it as strongly as, as I can. When we turn the publishing rights of our story over to God so it becomes his story, then and only then can it make an eternal difference in someone else's life. Now listen to that again. I know it's long, but, but it's a significant point. When we turn the publishing rights of our story over to God so it becomes his story, then and only then can it make an eternal difference in someone else's life. In other words, if I'm hanging on to my story then what happens is, is my story always boomerangs back to glorify me or to say, woe is me. But at the point that I, I, I turn the publishing rights, does that, I hope that makes sense. At the point that I, I turn that all over to God, then he can do something with it that makes a t an eternal difference in someone else's life. As long as I'm hanging on to the rights to that story. And I use it, like I said, whether I'm understanding that or not, or not all the time, to glorify me, or even to say, woe is me, then it doesn't become God's story. He wants to make your story his story. And he'll do that if you turn it over to him. Uh, you think, um, I was thinking about that. Why, why does that make a difference? Why does it make a difference that God has those rights to everything that's been a part of my story? The thing is, is, is that when I turn it over to him, the outcome has no, no ego, no pride attached to it. So he can do whatever he wants to in there to bring about what he wants to bring about. He owns not only the story itself, but he, he also knows exactly when and how that story needs to be told. And when you turn it over to him, he gives it back to you and he begins to reveal to you when and how it's, it's supposed to be told. It, it comes out in the right places, in the right times. Um, the stories that are a part of our life, he'll use them. They need to be told. But like I said, he needs to be the publisher. I remember when my, when my father gave his heart to Christ a long, long, long time ago. 
and dad is now with Christ. But the thing that he shared with me uh, in, a, in a side dialogue after he shared with the church, because he was not this kind of a person. He, he, he did not share about emotional things. But God just broke him so much. And, and the words that came out of his mouth, he could barely, he could barely verbalize them. And all he, all he could get out at first was, I heard this man speak about John 15, where it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then he just broke up. And the reason that he broke up was, was he was realizing this connectedness that he now had with Jesus. That he now had with God the Father that hadn't been there. And we never talked about this kind of stuff in our house. But he was sharing that. And it was coming from this place of just acknowledging that God, the vine, is going to allow me to be a branch in what he does. And he was just completely humbled. He spoke about how he had not... Uh, he said, the speaker just went on about this portion of scripture. And he said... You know, and my dad said, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm needing to learn again what it means to abide. But all of his testimony, everything he was sharing in his story was about a God who had reached out to him and said, I am the vine and you are the branches. You are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. See, this is the thing. If you, if you go to John 15, 5, in fact, that whole verse, it reads this way. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But here's the last part. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That scripture is not saying that there's nothing that you will ever do in the, in the very literal sense. It's saying that there is nothing you will ever do or accomplish in an eternal way apart from Christ. Because that is not in you. That is not in me. I can't, I can't, nobody through Ev can find an eternal difference in their life. And nobody through, no one through any of you, just because of who you are, can get to something that is eternal. But through the story of your life, overshadowed by God's story or embraced into God's story, there are people who can meet Jesus for the very first time. And that's how it has to work. And my uh, notes just got blown away there again. The second thing we, we see when God steps in is that it short circuits the work of the enemy. It short circuits the work of the enemy. So what was Peter rescued from? I read that the second half of verse 11. He's rescued from Herod's plan. Herod's plan was, for, was really for Peter's execution too. It, it doesn't specifically say that, but verse 4 says that there was a trial planned. And the reality is, we know, it was a trial that Peter was going to lose. Just as James had, had been arrested and, and executed, that was what was going to happen. I want to say to you today that the enemy, the enemy, excuse me, has plans for all of us, just as Jesus does. And the plans that the enemy has are not for success. They're not for good for anyone. That's one of the things that I've learned in this life in respect to good. The enemy is not for good. In fact, I said this a few weeks ago. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the Bible says. But God wants, our, wants good for our life. You, I want you to repeat that with me. God is for my good, okay? You ready? God is for my good. Say it one more time. God is for my good. Now, now here's a second half that goes with that, though. But he's also for our good. Say that part with me. He is also for our good. And I'm never the one that gets to define what that good looks like. See, if I stop with those other statements, it means... It, it means or it suggests that everything that I would say is good or bad, God, God is going to focus in on those things that I suggest to him, which I do every once in a while. Anybody else with me? <laughs> this would be really good, God. <laughs> How about you do this? So if I stop right there and I say God is for my good and he's for our good, and I'm the one that gets to define that, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to look, 
it, and, and I'm telling him, so it needs to look like this, then I have really squeezed an omnipotent, omniscient, uh, omnipresent God into a human cubicle, so to speak, and said to him, this is how you need to do things. That is not God. So the last part of that idea is this. He has to be the one who defines what is my good and what is our good. And I can't just continue to tell him this is what it needs to look like. In Genesis 50, some of you are familiar with this story. And I'm taking just this one verse out of context, but it does fit for what I'm illustrating here. In Genesis 50, Joseph looks his own brothers, his own brothers literally by blood. He looks them right in the eyes and he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So God is able to take then those things that the enemy intended for evil and turn them into his good. Let's keep going. Verses 12 through 16. Acts chapter 12. When this had dawned on him, this uh, the fact that God had rescued him by this angel. He's speaking, uh, we're speaking about Peter here. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. I'm sorry, I'm wrestling with the wind again on these pages. had gathered and were praying. In verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhonda, actually no, it's Rhoda, but I, I inserted an N in there because I know a lady named Rhonda, came to answer the door. Verse 14, and when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Verse 15, you're out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. So when God steps in, number one, it's all about him. He wants that story to be about what he does, and not just about what we do. Secondly, it short circuits the work of the enemy. And finally, it often surprises even the church. <laughs> I wish it didn't. I wish we were so leaning into the spirit that no matter what he did, we would just jump up and down and celebrate and, and, and go, wow, God is on the move. But, but it surprises us sometimes. The words that we read about there, it says, uh, when Rhonda, I mean, Rhoda comes to the door, um, and, and uh, to see who's there and sees Peter standing at the door, uh, she leaves him standing there. <laughs> I just think that's so funny. I mean, you just, just try to imagine that for a moment. There is Peter, released from jail, led by an angel. He comes and knocks at the door uh, to meet and greet some people he knows. And they know him, and they see that it's Peter or understand that it's Peter, but they run and leave him standing at the door. <laughs> And to go tell everybody else. And then the group that's gathered there says to her, uh, Rhoda, I'll get it right this time. They say, you are out of your mind. The Greek word there uh, for that whole phrase in English, you're out of your mind, is minomai. And it literally means raving mad. You are raving mad. Um, it's the root word from where, or it's the root of where we get our English word maniac or mania. My no my. And then they say it must be his angel. And lastly, it tells us that they were astonished at the very end. The Greek word uh, for astonished is exist, exi I'm sorry, existemi, existemi. And it means to tremble with amazement. So, so Peter is there, the, uh, the living testimony to something that God has done. And the church, represented by these people, are so shocked, amazed, um, surprised, whatever you want to put in there, um, they, do, they just don't even believe it. What does this remind you of? Think back to, uh, to part of the gospel story. A woman says she sees someone. She goes to tell the rest of the disciples whom she has seen, and they tell her that 
can't be right. She, she tries everything she can to explain to them, but the church is so shocked and surprised they won't believe her. You know, I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus. That's exactly the same way it happened. A woman and, and then two walking on a road together. They come back to the rest of the church and they say this is what happened. And they, and they can't even listen and believe them. In fact, they tell them to stop talking. Now, why is it, and I leaned into this just a little bit for a second, but why is it that the church struggles sometimes with believing the testimony a powerful testimony, a testimony of hope and encouragement. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons that we could give. Sometimes we get too comfortable with, with our discouragement. That it's difficult for us to experience someone else who's saying, don't be discouraged. Jesus is with us. He, he's working for our good. And sometimes we're so comfortable in our discouragement that we fight off good words of support and encouragement. I, I don't know if I'm talking to anybody today, but I just want to challenge you. Don't, don't be so comfortable in your discouragement that you, you, you fight off the good, the beauty that God wants to give you today. Another reason is because we, we too often see God with human limitations. Now, this is something that I think all of us can kind of step into a bit today. We bring God down to our level rather than letting him bring us up to his. And so we don't imagine that he can do something significant like this. We see God instead with human limitations. He's like us. <laughs> we make a God in our own image instead of the reverse. He's like us. He's just a little bit smarter than us. He's just a little bit stronger, a little bit more able. Uh, again, I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody, but what you've just created is a God with a little G. And it's not the God of the Bible. I want to ask you today as we sort through our own individual lives, but even this, this situations that we're working through today, do you really want a God with a little G? Are you interested with a God that his name is written with a little g? Or do you want a God whose name is written capital G, capital O, capital D? Let me, let me twist that just a little bit more. Instead of do you want a God with a little g, do you need a God with a little g, or do you need a God with a capital G, a capital O, and a capital D? I'm just going to say to you, I, I know who I need. I, I, there, there's an abundance of God's little g, lowercase g, that they're all around us today. And they'll try to draw us into different ways of thinking I want to sweep that whole mess clear because I need today a God with a capital G, a capital O, and a capital D. Is there anybody else who feels that way? None of those, other, <laughs> none of those others are going to be able to help me the way I need help, to help us the way that we need help. Lastly this morning, verse 17 let me get there again. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet after they opened the door and saw him. He motioned with, their, with his hand for them to be quiet. And he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In your outline, the final point there today is this. Our story has more than one chapter. Our story has more than one chapter. And I'd suggest this to you as well. If the story of your experience with Christ 
is limited to a testimony that comes from 10 years ago or two years ago, two months ago, or even two days ago, it's time for renewal. Let me say that again. <laughs> if the testimony, if the story, let's stay there because some people understand story better than testimony. If the story of your life in Christ is one that is only re represented by something that happened 10 years ago, it might be 20 or 30. I, I know some people I've talked to who that's where they're stuck. But if the story of your connection to Jesus is something that happened 10 years ago, two years ago, two months ago, or even two days ago, and that's all you have, I'm not saying you shouldn't keep those stories together and gathered, like I said a few minutes ago, in God's hands as the publisher, because he wants to use those stories. But if that's all you have, today you need renewal. Today you need for him to come and give you a new story of new freedom for you, for someone else, because that's the way he works. He is not the God just of the yesterdays of your life. He is the God of today and tomorrow and all of your tomorrows. Don't be satisfied with just one chapter. Like I said, it's not that it's not that he will never use those older stories again, but he's building in you something that is so much more helpful than just one story or one chapter. He's building in us a continuing story of how God is alive and well today and how he can use you today, not just in your yesterdays. Manna was only good for one day. Except for the, I should say, except for the day where you could gather enough for two days because of the Sabbath. But if you go back to the Old Testament in general, manna was good for one day. The, the scripture says in Exodus 16, 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day the people were to go out each day and gather enough for that day he has new manna for us tomorrow he has manna for us today but he has new manna for us tomorrow it's interesting in that story to kind of wrap this all together is that Peter is so about what's going to happen next he doesn't even stop in for a biscuit and coffee. <laughs> the end of that story says he, he tells them what happened and then he left for another place. Why? Because he knew that there were more things that God was going to use him to do. I can't just stay here. There's more for me. I just feel like too often we we read these stories and we go, wow, Peter was something else. And he was. But so are we. The story that he has been writing up to this moment in your life and in my life it's not done yet. It's, it's not done yet. He wants to strengthen you today for what he intends to do, as it said with Peter, in another place tomorrow. And at the moment we, we get a grasp of that, we become... We become so much more as a church. We become so much more as individuals because he has the freedom to do with us whatever he wants within the context of his story in our lives. The song we're closing with here is just a reminder. Nothing that I just read 
the book of Acts happens way before the book of Revelation. What's happening right now, we're not, we're not there yet. And so with each day, we're given new opportunity. New opportunity for us to live and to serve, but to see him do these things just like this again and again and again and again and again if we stay the course let's sing together See you 
do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe, God, I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe, God, I'll see you do it again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Oh God, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hand. This is my confidence. You never fail me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's give these folks here just a, a, a little bit of thanks. Amen. Amen. I also want to acknowledge Ian, and I'm looking around, Ian and Gary and, and Josh, and over there at the other end, I think there's Martin and Boom and Chris, and uh, who am I missing? It looks like there's a couple of, they're, they're grouping, they're growing a new church over there, the, the, the church of the traffic attendant people over there. It's good to have them. And then Denise and the other folks who were helping uh, distribute the elements and everything today, can we let them know we appreciate them as well? <laughs> and lastly, the people who you do not see, but they're they're in the in the uh, sanctuary right now, up where all the computer equipment and everything is. There's Kristen and Marlis and uh, Mark and uh, Brian and Janelle is up there as well. And so and so, let them know and we that we appreciate them and uh, and let's. I'm going to ask Grantley to come and pray a benedictory a benediction prayer here. But I just want to say, I, before I hand the mic to him, that um, you know, there's there's people who have said, "Man, we we got to be in the last days. This is so hard." You know, I, I just want to rem remind you that uh, the Book of Acts also talks about what happens in the last days. It says that there's struggle, but it also says this, people. It says, "In those last days, I will pour out my spirit." I will pour out my spirit. There's people who are going to have dreams and vision that are going to help us in this time. And we get that expressly at this time, if it is the last days. And so I am not afraid of that. I'm excited about the pouring out of the spirit part. Are you with me? Amen. Thank you. And thank you for coming today. And Thank you for helping us feel warm up here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God is doing great things. And, and let us not forget that in the midst of our trials and tribulations or what's going on in the world, God is still at work. He's still in charge. And he's not surprised by our circumstances. Father, we thank you today that we can sing this song, Great is Your Faithfulness. And you have never failed us yet. And I can't think about one time in my life where you have failed me. And I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that your promises still stand. We can stand on those promises, Lord. As that song, old song says, standing on the promises of Christ my King. And we stand on those promises today that you will keep us. You will protect us. You will deliver us. You will be our stronghold. You will be our refuge. You will be our comforter. You will be our deliverer, our protector, our king of kings and our lord of lords. That you will be with us every day no matter whatever we go through. 
We thank you from your word today that you have a new story for us. We don't have to live in our old stories. We don't have to keep telling the same testimony all the time. But you can give us a new testimony each day because you are at work. So as we go from here today, I pray that you, we would carry your spirit and your power with us. And as we enter this week, that we will be that light and that salt, that testimony to those around us. Let us see your hand at work. Let us experience the power of your presence. And let us be to those around us who need hope and encouragement, sources of hope and encouragement as we point people to you. And we pray your journey and mercies on us today and, and our families and our children. And God, we pronounce blessing. May your peace and your comfort, your grace and your mercy rest upon everyone here today. In Jesus' name, amen. I've seen you move, you move the mountain, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountain, and I You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I see you. I've seen you move. I've seen you move, God. You moved the mountain, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I. And I believe, I see you do it again. And I believe, I see you do it again. And I believe, I see you do it again, God. Thank you so much, guys, for coming out. Be blessed, be a blessing. Have a great week, everybody. Love you all.